Good day and welcome to this week's episode of Captains of Industry with myself, Fifi Peters. Our captain in the hot seat this week is Jeffrey White. He is a CEO of Agility Africa, one of the leading logistics companies on the continent. Jeffrey, thanks so much for your time. It's a pleasure. You have been in business many years. You have been recognized across various global platforms for your business leadership, such as the, uh, the World Economic Forum. But take us back to the founding years. So where are you from? How how did you grow up? So I'm, I'm Scottish. I grew up in Glasgow, which is an industrial city in, in Scotland, and uh, went to school in Scotland and then university in Scotland, where I did economics and uh, business studies. Played a lot of rugby when I was young. All right. Um, and uh, no, I had a very normal upbringing. And uh, siblings? What was um, I've got a brother who uh, is retired now, but was a banker uh, for his whole career and uh, born, he lived his whole life in Scotland. And how would you, how would you describe your, your family background? I mean, was, was, was life a bit challenging or was it just a normal um, middle-class family upbringing? It was a normal middle-class family upbringing. Uh, I went to a private school called Marxton Castle in, in Scotland. Um, it was a struggle for my parents to meet the fees, but in those days they were a fraction of, of today. But um, no, I lived as a normal middle class child doing things middle class children do. And why economics? Um, economics had always interested me. My father was uh, a successful businessman, um, but worked for big multinationals uh, most of his career. Um, and I don't know, growing up, life and discussions had always been around what makes the world tick, what makes politics work, what makes business work. So it was a natural progression of, of interest to understand that environment and get attracted to it. And what was the, the first job that, that, that you got following your, your, your graduating from Basti? So the first job when I left university was as a graduate trainee with the largest then conglomerate in, in the UK. Um, came out top of that program and uh, they said, right, where would you like to work? And I said, I'd like a stay in Scotland. And they gave me my first job at the very south of England. So I left home then to take up that job and have never been back to living in Scotland since. I mean, as a young man, I can imagine that, you know, it must have been exciting, uh, fun times, but also challenging. So what would you say were the, the most significant challenges that you faced uh, within your founding years in your career? And how, how did you overcome them? So I think it's always just to differentiate yourself from the crowd. So it's a question of doing that 10% extra that other people don't. So I used to work incredibly hard. I speak to my children now about the sort of hours we used to put into the office. And I think that's just step by step. You, you make stepping stones on your career path. A lot of it is being in the right place at the right time. Uh, I think there's an element that helps if you can be, remain objective about what you're doing and always look at it from the outside in and come up with new suggestions and innovative ideas. And that really just starts to differentiate you from the crowd during your 20s and then through during your 30s. Failure, um, I imagine, is quite a, um, or it's always seen as a, a big feature in, in climbing up that corporate ladder. Um, any failures in your career path? Yeah, there's been a couple. I think the, the challenge around failure is to recognize it early. And I think um, as you get older, you get much more um, objective about recognizing it early. When you're younger, you keep bashing your head against the wall, thinking it'll come right and thinking it will, will um, solve itself. The reality is with experience, you can make that judgment call much quicker and actually pivot and go off and do something that's more productive. You mentioned the fact that um, a dad or your father was a, a businessman. Was he one of your inspirations in business or did you have others as well? So he was, he was uh, an inspiration to me in business. And my, the first uh, chairman I worked for was um, at the conglomerate, Sir Owen Green. And uh, he was hugely inspirational. I mean, he was running Britain's largest conglomerate at the time. We're talking and about Lonro here. No, this is, this is before that, before I joined Lonro. So this is my first job where I, as part of the graduate trainee scheme, I became his PA for a year. And the, the learning curve and the knowledge that you had adopted at that 12-month uh, cycle was huge. And in terms of, of, of mentorship, um, this is also one of um, the uh, key traits that are recognized among successful business people. Although some business people have said that um, they, they, they haven't been mentored by, by, by anyone specifically, but what's your, your take on mentorship? 
So I think mentorship is, is hugely beneficial. I was mentored uh, through the early years of my career, but not, not later. Um, I uh, take time out to mentor some of our staff within uh, Agility, my current role, and to work with them and explain why we make the decisions we make and give them an insight into how the business actually works. All right. So, I mean, talking about Lonro and all the other um, industries that you, that you um, eventually worked in before ending up at, at Agility, what inspired those career moves? So I think um, opportunity, um, mostly it was people coming to say, come and work with us, so being headhunted. And you have to change career to progress rapidly, I believe. I don't think you can stay in, in uh, the current environment. You can't stay in the same job and just work your way up the ladder. Actually, moving is good. And moving also gives you a different set of experiences, a different set of understanding. So I think you don't want to be moving every 12 months. But um, if you look at my career path, I mean, every sort of five years has been a significant change. And I think that's hugely uh, beneficial in broadening your experience and giving you a much bigger knowledge base, knowledge base from which to make experience uh, decisions. All right. So 2014 is when you arrive at Agility, and to uh, I imagine you know deal with the the the, the rollout of the company on the the African continent. Doing business in Africa for you right now, and especially as we compare it to 2014, what's changed? So I think. Um, the continent, so we're, we're investing in building large-scale uh, warehouse parks, which is an infrastructure play. So firstly, the strategy we put together in 2014 for Africa is a 20-year a vision of where Africa will be in 20 years. So you get tantrums and hiccups along the way, and you get slows and highs along the way, but the macro trend of what's going on in most of Africa, so South Africa uh, northwards, um, uh, is actually still very positive and very strong. And we've been rolling out our, our infrastructure project to really great success. We're very thrilled with the, the progress that it's making. But I mean rolling out of infrastructure in a continent that suffers from a, a deficit that runs into to, to the billions, in fact I think the trillions of dollars, that surely must be a challenge. So the, actually the opposite. The reality is there's a huge infrastructure differential of what's required and what's being funded. We took one niche little market, so we're not building airports, we're not building roads, we're not building ports, we're building warehouse parks. And actually, on one level, that doesn't sound hugely exciting, but the reality is proper warehousing is the foundation for economic growth. It's a, it's a fundamental essential to enable businesses to come in and do business on the continent, for the continent to be competitive as an exporter, for regional trade to grow and develop. So although it's, it's a very small part of the infrastructure gap, the money that we're committing to these large international standard uh, parks uh, really is generating prosperity and growth. So the why of what we're doing it is as fulfilling as the bottom line. And is that bottom line fulfilling now? Because I mean, we're reading about global economic growth taking uh, quite a bit of a dip as a result of a whole host of issues. So are you getting tenants in those industrial parks? So we're getting great traction with two sectors. One is multinationals. And interestingly, in today's environment, most multinationals want to come to Africa and be capital light. So they're not looking to spend a huge amount of capital. They want to come in. They want to access the market. There's huge demand to get to the market, but they want to do it on a capital light model. So we're counter cyclical to that to the extent that we're committing the capital. We're building the infrastructure. If you need a warehouse for your packaging plant, processing plant, storage, distribution, you can come to me, sign a lease, and I'll give you the keys and you can move in Monday so it's not we'll build it for you in the next three years so from a multinational perspective we're taking away all the land risk uh, that's associated with Africa the construction risk about building on time and on budget which is a huge challenge in Africa so we're adopting all that on behalf of our customers and then we're delivering a finished product that just makes it incredibly easy for them to come into the market 
Likewise, we see the second sort of half of the market being African companies and SME growth and development. So again, they struggle to raise capital for building infrastructure at competitive prices. We've got an example just recently in Ghana where their bank said, no, no, we'll lend you the money to build yourself a, a production facility, but wanted to charge 29% in local interest. Well, they came in under our SME program. They paid three months deposit, signed a lease. We gave them the keys. The facility was there waiting and ready to go, and that transformed their business. So we believe that in, in those two markets, there's actually a huge amount of unfulfilled demand. And certainly currently on our, uh, our trial project in Ghana, and now on the, the new project in Mozambique, in uh, Côte d'Ivoire, and in Nigeria, we're seeing really strong traction. Welcome back. I am still in conversation with Jeffrey White, the CEO of Agility Africa, one of the leading uh, logistics companies on the continent. Of course, before we went to the break, we were discussing doing business in Africa, and this is where we will pick up the uh, conversation with uh, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, thanks once again. Because Agility operates in quite a number of markets on, on, on the continent, and um, some doing a lot better than others. Where, where would you say you're seeing the best pockets of, of opportunity and where, where are you more cautious? So we're, we're very optimistic about the macro rollout of the growth across the continent. Some countries are doing better than others. Some are commodity related, so tied to the commodity cycle. But the, the really strong drivers we see across the continent is the growing middle class, the urbanization of the, the de demographics, so people moving into the cities. And when you leave a, a, a subsistence living on the agricultural side and you come into town, you become a consumer of everything. So you, you have to buy and pay for everything. So that drives consumer growth. So we think the FMCG market and uh, the growth of regional trade is going to be a big upside for the continent. Uh, so in terms of your, your headquarters, it could have been in South Africa, um, one of the biggest players on, on the continent, or Nigeria also um, the biggest, although the two, you know, they, they go in, they swing from time to time. But you chose Dubai as, as, as your home um, to operate from Africa. Why so? So Dubai has got a huge number of African-focused businesses setting up head office in Dubai. And I think part of that is obviously the tax regime and the, the quality of life, but a big part of it is the connectivity. If you want to get to lots of African countries, actually Emirates now gives you the best network to fly in and out and be able to transact business. So um, London's equally sort of good, but um, Dubai as a, as a gateway for Africa is getting more and more traction. So you mentioned the, the connectivity as being a, a plus of doing business in Dubai as well as uh, more favourable tax laws. Um, any, any, any sore spots that you think that could be improved there? So Dubai is, is uh, remarkable. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's developed out of nothing in an incredibly short period of time. And there's a, a, an interesting contrast when I've got visitors from Africa that are coming to Dubai and you show them developments and say, 10 years ago that wasn't there, and uh, look, what's, look what can be achieved in a very short time frame. So I think um, Dubai is uh, a good uh, beacon for African countries to look at and say, okay, actually, if you get government regulation working properly, if you get taxes working properly, if you can uh, make intelligent investment decisions, attract foreign direct investment, there's no reason why your economy can't grow incredibly quickly. Uh, talking about that, that, that middle class, that rising middle class that was or has been a promise in terms of doing business in Africa for, for quite a long time, many haven't been patient enough to stick around for it to be realized or have reassessed that model to say it might not actually be realized. So you mentioned your 20-year strategy as, as, as agility. So, so someone watching this from New York or, or, or from the UK um, wanting to know, going long on Africa, why why, why so long? Because, as I said, I think the, the macro uh, economic data is really very impressive. 
You've got a growing oil and gas industry in both East and West and now South Africa. That's a big driver of foreign direct investment and a big driver of growth and prosperity. You've got 65% of the world's um, arable land that's uncultivated is in, is in Africa. You've got a global population going from 6 billion to 9 billion plus that actually isn't, nobody's quite sure how they're going to feed themselves. So I think the macro drivers that are, that are um, uh, available on the continent can make you very optimistic about where it's going. What about the um, policy drivers right now as the continent gears to um, remove barriers to, to trade and, and also services through that Africa Free Trade Continental Deal? I mean, is this something that, that uh, is attractive to agility by way of strategy? So that, that is fundamental to our vision of the future, if you like, our 20-year strategy. So I think there's three things that we think are happening. The Africa Free Trade Zone will eventually get, and execution is going to be a challenge, but will eventually become the biggest free trade zone in the world. Um, we think the um, growth of e-commerce and e-fulfillment is going to be huge across the continent. Now, when you look at Jumeirah and people, it's very nascent just now, but the reality is that e-commerce is just going to scale and scale and scale. And for e-commerce fulfillment, you need four times as much warehousing in market than you do for traditional logistics. So that's going to be a big driver of requiring for warehouse space. So that was one of our macro drivers. And the last one, we think, with uh, the advent of the fourth industrial revolution, with um, online uh, manufacturing and uh, local printing and 3D printing and, and the, the technology breakthrough that's coming, we're seeing more and more global manufacturers looking to say we want to batch produce locally rather than the traditional model of we're going to make 50 million units in China and ship them all around the world. We think there's a really growing market where they say actually we'll batch make 50,000. We can be much more nimble to market demand. We can change the product. We can make it uh, uh, more applicable to, to local demographics, uh, etc. So that also will need warehousing and, and premises to operate from on the continent. So we think these, these roles and these macro trends really underline the requirement for international standard warehouse parks that enable people to do business. So it's not rocket science, it's, it's a good quality facility in a secure environment where the IT never goes down, the power never goes down, it's somewhere where your staff will feel safe to work. When we went out and did the, the research, it was an amazing number of companies that came back and said, the problem with all the warehousing in Africa is you can't attract quality staff to come and work there because it's a horrible environment and, and they don't feel safe. You come into one of our parks, it's 500,000 square meters, so 50 hectares in size. It's landscaped, there's a coffee shop, there's a bank, there's a pharmacy. It's, it's a pleasant environment for your staff to work in. Uh, talking about that fourth industrial revolution further and how you see it further shaping the, the logistics industry and, and, and freight and, and shipping and just the general movement and storage of, of, of goods. So, as, as I said, I mean, we think e-commerce is going to scale hugely across the continent. Culturally, you've got a very young demographic that is very comfortable buying things on their phone or, or online. So compared to developed markets where you've got a, an older demographic that actually still struggles with the, the concept of online shopping, Africa can adopt it really quickly. And I think that cultural step change is, is coming very visibly now. I mean, if you look at mobile wallets, 57% of the world's mobile wallets are actually in Africa. So we think, we think that platform that we're building is perfectly aligned with the requirements that are coming for e-commerce fulfillment um, and the movement of goods. I mean, great opportunities that you're outlining there, particularly in this more medium to longer term. But right now we do sit with um, many, many African countries not doing the best by way of growth. And because we live in a global system, even globally, global growth is slowing down. To what, to what degree is the, the economy, the state of the, the local African economy and the state of the, the global economy, a, a, a concern for agility? 
So the global economy we probably see as a positive for Africa. So I think if you're a CEO sitting elsewhere in the world, you're writing your 10-year strategy, and you're saying, where am I going to find growth? And we've got a whole lot of customers who didn't look at Africa before, but are now saying, actually, for growth in the next 10 years, we have to engage with Africa. And, we, and when they start looking at it, they understand the demographics, the urbanization that's going on, the growth that's going on. So I think from a, a global perspective, slowing down traditional markets actually makes people more focused on coming to the continent and doing business on the continent. And from a local uh, perspective? Or? From a local perspective, Africa's still got some of the strongest economies in the world. So Cote d'Ivoire, where we're, we're opening uh, one of our warehouse parks in January, um, that we've seen huge demand, and, and Cote, Cote d'Ivoire's pushing on sort of 9-10% uh, GDP growth. Ghana's uh, growing very strong. We've just opened in Mozambique. Uh, in Mozambique, although it's a tiny, tiny economy currently, it's going to become the third biggest gas producer in the world. You've got arguably between sort of 60 initially rising to $120 billion of foreign direct investment going into the country. It's going to grow phenomenally. So again, it's taking this longer term view as to what the opportunities are and aligning with those growth points. I mean, in terms of doing business also lately, more commonly, um, things like cybercrime and cybersecurity and also things like the risks of climate change are, are, are cited as key business concerns in that, that could catch many people off guard if they don't, don't take them seriously today. I mean, as Jeffrey and as, as Agility, what, what do you foresee as the, the major risk points of, of, of operating in the next five to ten years and how are you navigating that? So we, as part of our, our site evaluation for, for building these warehouse parks, which have a sort of 40-year lifespan, um, part of that process is actually understanding the climate change predictions and what could happen to that environment. Um, we've actually designed the buildings that they're hurricane resistant and, and um, uh, of quality. And then from a sustainable development perspective, we're very focused on using LED lighting, on our carbon footprint emissions, on um, way proper waste waste management, uh, proper security. So creating an environment that really stands up from a worldwide uh, perspective and is, is similar to warehouses that we would build in Singapore or, or in Dubai um, and the same caliber and the same opportunity here. And we believe that market is is that market demand is moving upscale very quickly. So people that used to operate out of a, a, a go down on, on a, a corner with no infrastructure and, and sort of an unmade up road are actually seeing the benefits both uh, psychologically and economically and, and commercially of actually moving into an environment where you can work five days a week. Uh, it's amazing how many customers you go and visit, even big multinationals that say, well, actually, we lose a, a day a week because the power is down and we're always having shrinkage because our stock gets stolen, etc. To be able to bring that business into a nice environment where you can be proud of your operations and you can know your waste is being treated properly, we recycle, where we're capturing rainwater, we're using uh, solar power, etc. Just creates an ethos around your business that is, is incredibly positive for an operational perspective. And just taking stock of, of your, your business uh, journey as we wrap up this interview, like in hindsight, is there anything that you would have done differently um, in terms of some of the decisions that you made? Hundreds of things. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think if I, if I look back on, on my career, um, highs, lows, or to it, but if I was to start again, I'd be very happy to repeat the same process. And for a young entrepreneur who is uh, wanting to one day achieve similar achievements as, as yourself, as a captain, what are the non-negotiables in terms of doing business? So I think building long-term relationships, um, it's amazing how many people you, you met along the journey who are now also CEOs of their business and uh, respecting those people in the early days and building those long-term relationships so that when you ring them up now, you've known them for 30 years and there's a, there's a rapport there. So trust and honesty and really your word is your bond. When you say you're going to do something, make sure it gets done. All right, Jeffrey, thanks so much for your time telling us there that your word is your bond. Make sure that it gets done. Of course, Agility taking a very long view of the continent, saying big opportunities lie in store. Of course, not without their risks, but the opportunities certainly outweighing that. From myself, Fifi Peters, thanks so much for watching this week's episode of Captains, and see you again next time. <laughs>